Well, hello again. Welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name's Graham. This is X-Plane and the Hot Start Challenger 650. Today we're going to take a look at some supplemental procedures we can carry out with the aircraft. We're simulating an aircraft with an unserviceable APU, and sometimes these things happen. But you don't want the aircraft to be stuck somewhere it's not supposed to be. You want to be able to complete the mission even if the APU is unserviceable. The APU is at the back of the aircraft and it's used to provide electrical power for the electrical systems on board and bleed air to run the air conditioning packs and also to start the engines. Without an APU, we need these machines to look after us instead. We've got a ground power unit at the front that provides AC power into the aircraft. And at the rear, we've got a device called an air start unit. That's a Detroit diesel engine with an air compressor that provides high pressure air into the port on the rear left of the aircraft. Now that high pressure air is used for engine starting. In extreme cases, it can be used for the air conditioning packs as well, but most operators will try and avoid that wherever possible because it's not clean air you're getting from this system. It's, uh, it's oily, smelly, dirty air, and you try and avoid feeding that into the aircraft. You'll also note that the high pressure air connection is on the left hand side. You can start the left hand engine, but you have to then get one of your uh, ground agents to walk up the aircraft and remove the hose. It's not the best thing to do. It's quite close to the operating engine. Now you can do it if you need to do that, but it's better to start the right hand engine first. We're also going to simulate a cross blade start. So we'll start the right engine on the air start unit and the left engine will use the left engine to help, uh, use the right engine, sorry, to help the left engine to start. In order to do that, we need to increase thrust on the running engine. And uh, although this blast fence is here, we're going to put the Challenger up to a very high power setting. It probably wouldn't be the best place to do it. So we'll, between the engine starts, we'll taxi out to the parking area or taxi out to the runway hold short, somewhere that we've got a little bit more space to run the engines up to power. Once we've done that, we'll have a look at flex thrust departure and uh, we'll also consider a very minor failure as we go flying. Right, let's jump inside. The aircraft is in the same state as you would have seen it at the start of the previous video. I'm very conscious of the fact that a lot of people don't have access to the Challenger documentation. It's very difficult to find on the internet. So I want to show you how to use the onboard checklist, the MFD checklist, to work through this process and it's very straightforward if you just deal with it in a logical manner. Let's ask the first officer for the engine start checklist. Engine start checklist. Doors. Closed. Parking brake and pressure. Checked and set. Fuel quantity and balance. That's fine. Checked. Beacon. Put the beacon on. On. Fuel boost pumps. Put both pumps on. On. Ignition. System A. Armed. Engine 2 start. So you see, up until now, it's a very similar start to what we've done. The only difference is on the overhead is the APU isn't running, external power is in use, and the LCV and isolation valves are selected out. But to start the engine, we need that bleed air. Now let's have a look at the study screen here. So study, engines, bleed system, and 10th stage. Remember, 10th stage is engine starting, air conditioning, pressurization, and 14th stage is ice protection. 10th stage. If it was APU air, it would be fed in here. If it's ground air, it's fed in here. But you see there's nothing between the two supplies there. So ground air can do exactly the same job as APU air. You'll notice also that there's a check valve here that feeds into the ejector jet pump that runs the pressurization system. That means as soon as we establish air pressure, you might see a pressurization uh, change. It's not running the air conditioning packs, it's just uh, changing the position of the outflow valve and there may be some trapped pressure inside the cabin due to temperature changes. I did say, however, that we don't want to use ground air into the air conditioning packs because that would be not great for them. They are selected closed at the moment, but I want to make sure they stay that way. So on the overhead, we'll make sure that the air conditioning packs are selected off. Looking at the 
MFD now. We need to make sure that the ground air supply is providing enough air. Click on summary here. We're looking for bleed pressure of uh, 45 pounds per square inch. We don't have that at the moment. So I need to tell the air start unit to provide the air. Now in other add-ons, we do this through a menu or through the EFB. But because this is a challenger and it's focused on that pilot experience, all we have to do is ask the ground crew if it's okay to start number two and listen to the diesel fire up and keep an eye on the pressures. Thumbs up to start. There's the air pressure. You can see the little pressurization spike. Bleed pressure is good for the start. And at this point onwards, it's just a standard start. So on the overhead panel, right engine, push and hold start. Light comes on. You have the diesel powered up. We've got oil pressure. I'm looking for 20% N2. Notice it's a little bit slower to spool. 20%, less than 120. N1's turning. Fuel on. Got fuel flow, I've got ITT and oil pressure. Fuel system. Excellent. So let's just wait for the engine to stabilize. Looking good, I've got two, four, six, and uh, just about two. That's all good. Fuel system, yep, we can do that. It's the check, so let's switch the boost pumps off. Check that we've got the two fuel pumps and the low pressure. There's low pressure and the two fuel pumps. And with that, this is where the procedures change a little bit. I'm only gonna put the right hand pump back on. And what I'm gonna do now is forget about the virtual first officer, because he only knows about standard operations. Instead, I'm going to close the window here. I'm going to pop up the MFD. I'm going to pop up the CCP here. And we'll manage the checklist ourselves from this point. So there isn't a particular checklist for this. But what we can do is use the next checklist as a guide to help us through it. So let's look at the engine start or the after start checklist. Let's go in here. It's asking for Gen 1 and Gen 2 on. If you look at the AC page here. You see that Gen 2 is available, but the external power is still providing the electricity. So let's fix that by putting Gen 2 on. External AC is now not being used. I can click the switch out for that. I'm not going to check these items off because I'm going to go back through these with the first officer and do them all fully. But just checking the items now, doing what's logical. Ignition can go to disarmed. Now it's asking to turn the packs on. Look at the summary page. We've still got bleed pressure from that uh, air start unit. I'm pretty much done with that. So let's get rid of them. Hand signals, ground power out. Takes the AC and the air start unit. Excellent. So to run the packs, I now need an air source. Normally that would be the APU, but now the right engine's running, I'll open the right side in stage valve and I'll put the packs on. Both pack switches are in, but it's only the right hand pack that's running because the isolation valve is closed. That's totally fine. Looking through the items here now, 14 stage doesn't matter at the moment. Flight controls don't matter. First flight of the day stuff doesn't matter. Nose wheel steering, that's an important thing. Let's have the nose wheel steering on. Looking through the rest of the list here, nothing interesting. On the next page, ATC, we're about to move on the airport, so let's put the transponder on. And that's uh, that checklist reviewed. So we haven't done any of the items, we've just picked the correct items for single engine taxi. Next checklist, taxi lights, brakes and steering, everything else can wait until we're ready to go. So on the subject of uh, brakes and steering, have a look at the hydraulic page here. You see we've got the number two hydraulic system is running from the engine on the 2A pump and number three is running 
with the 3A electric pump. That gives me no slow steering, inboard brakes and outboard brakes. So that's all I need to taxi the aircraft. If I was taxiing on the left-hand engine only, I would need to turn the 2B pump on to make sure that I've got outboard brakes. The 2B pump is up here. I need to put that to on if I want to taxi on the left-hand engine only. It's a lot easier to taxi on the right engine. Right, let's clear that. I'll get rid of the checklist now because I'm done with that. I'm done with that. Look at the left-hand side. Look at the right-hand side. Ask the ground crew to take the chocks out. And then we should be on our way. Hopefully this is all making sense. Round to cockpit. Chocks have been removed. Excellent. With that, we'll put the taxi light on, release the parking brake, and off we go. So breakaway thrust, it's around about 40%. Uh, if I just bring up the summary momentarily, you'll see that even at 40% N1, we're only making 27 PSI. To cross bleed start, we need 60 PSI. So that's going to be a large amount of power coming out the back of the aircraft, a large amount of thrust. Quick check on the brakes. Make sure we've got steering. I'll use my tiller for that. And let's keep rolling. There were some questions on the forum about using the tiller versus rudder steering and how the Challenger knows which to use. It's really quite simple. If you've got a tiller control, maybe a paddle on the joystick or you use your twist grip for it, if you have a tiller, all you need to do is steer with the tiller and the aircraft will then know you've got a tiller control and it will only give you rudder fine steering, that little bit of steering on the nose wheel if you use the rudder axis. If you don't touch the tiller and just steer with the rudder, you'll get full steering. Now, the only time that'll catch you out is if you reload the aircraft onto the runway and try go flying at the very first flight you've done with it. Because then you'll have full steering available, full nose wheel steering available on your rudder pedals, even if you normally use the tiller for that. So whenever you load the aircraft, if you have a tiller, just give the tiller a little wiggle to make sure that the aircraft is aware the tiller's there. I've recently upgraded my graphics card. Previously, I had a GTX uh, 1060, six gigabytes. Now it's running on a RTX 3070 Ti. I've also got Enhanced Skyscapes installed. Enhanced Skyscapes makes a huge difference to how the sky looks. It works, uh, actually works really well on my GTX 1060, which is a very old card, but uh, on the RTX 3070, it looks a lot better. It's having almost like having a new lease of life in X-Plane 11. Excellent. So the reason we're taxiing out single engine is just to give me space to do that uh, cross blade start. But even if you were doing a normal start on a very long taxi, it might be worth considering a single engine taxi. Just be aware of the potential for fuel imbalance. If you've got fuel in the ox tanks, it's not usually an issue because the motive system uh, will essentially keep your your right wing tank topped up when the engine's running. But uh, if you've got a lighter fuel load, just be careful about it. If you need to, you can drain some fuel into the ox to rebalance. So even though we're single engine taxiing, you still have all the checks to do after engine start. So if it's the first flight of the day, allow a good 10 minutes to start and try and make sure you've got somewhere static to do it. So if you're going to be in a, in a holding pad or waiting in a long queue of traffic, then that's maybe okay. But um, for a reasonably short taxi out, it's not worth it. It's not like the A320 series where all you do is start the engine, do the flight control checks, and then you're good to go. There's a, the challenge is fairly involved. Right, this looks like a reasonable place to do the crossblade start. So, set the parking brake and we'll hold it. Now remember the first officer's checklist is at a different part and all I want to do is to make sure that it's safe to start the, the other engine. 
And to do that, we're simply going to ask them to restart the checklist. So checklist, restart current checklist. You can do this on a binding as well. Engine start checklist. Doors. Closed. Parking brake and pressure. Checked and set. Fuel quantity and balance. That's fine. Checked. Beacon. On. Fuel boost pumps. Now, I said it's a little bit uh, awkward having the checklist the way they are, but it's important just to do everything in slow time. On. Ignition. And make sure everything's right. Armed. Engine 2 start. Fuel system. So we've already checked the fuel system. We can move on to the next stage, which is engine 1 start. Checked. Engine 1 start. So, as I said, we need 60 PSI on the running side. The only way to get that pressure up is to increase thrust. Now, I've only got a single throttle axis on my hardware, so I need to desync them. I'm just going to hold the throttle with my mouse and then push the axis out the way. With that, I'll increase the axis, I'll increase the number two throttle with my mouse and looking for 60 psi. We'll give it a little increase. I'm holding it on the tow brakes with the parking brake, make sure it's not moving and increase. It'll need about 70% N1. That's a lot of power. So you want to make sure the aircraft is not moving and make sure that nothing behind you will be affected by that power increase. You can see it's a very high power setting for this part of the part of the airport. There you go, about 70%. Now it's a normal start. So left engine start. I've got oil pressure. 90% N2. I'm going to move the lever and I'm going to hold it and just wiggle my joystick to desync it. We've got ITT fuel flow. So it's a bit awkward with a single axis. Remember, if you're holding the lever, it won't move. Engine start checklist complete. Excellent. After start checklist, next. All I'm going to do is move my hardware throttle back. It will pick up the right hand engine and the left hand engine and now they're back down to idle. And that's the crossblade start complete. And from this point onwards, it's normal operations. So let's just continue the checklist. After start checklist, generator one and two. On, checked AC and DC. Ignition, disarmed, packs. So packs. 14th stage. Now we need to reset it. Remember, we've got the left-hand side to open. So this is a bit different we're looking to run the air conditioning uh, off both engines. So I'll put both of the 10 stage valves open and also the 14 stage valves open. open. Cow anti-ice. So these are the first flight of the day checks and you've already seen me do all of these. So I'm going to skip these and continue on. Flight controls. Flight controls. We'll do the normal check. There we go. Check the rudder. Done. Checked. Ground spoilers. Again, the little symbol here says first flight of the day. Flight spoilers. Cal anti-ice. Supplemental ground wing. Fuel balance. That is checked. Checked. Trims. So trims, I've got six units. Neutral and neutral. Three set for takeoff. No steer. Armed. APR. APR, same check as before. Number one. APR test one OK. And number two, APR and APR test two OK. That's checked. Checked. Armed. ADG unit. Hold it. Two seconds. Make sure the light goes off. It does. Tested. Supplemental ground wing anti-ice. Skip. Cal anti-ice. Skip. Wing anti-ice. 14 stage isolation valve. Wing anti-ice. ATS. N1 TO, ATC TCAS, TARA, after start checklist complete, Cal anti ice. Right, so when it says the checklist complete, it's gone back to the items that we've skipped. All we have to do is ask them for the next checklist. Taxi checklist, taxi lights, on, wing and Cal anti ice. Not required. Norm on or off, brakes and steering. That's checked. Checked. Reverse thrust. First light of the day. If taxiing the de-ice, pause checklist here until a paper de-ice checklist is complete. Flaps. 
20. Altimeters. Set and cross check. Radar weather. On. Takeoff briefing. As before. Reviewed. Taxi checklist complete. Excellent. Thrust. But again, it's on the items that we skipped. I'm going to put the headset on to make it a little bit quieter now. And then what we're going to do is take a look at a flex thrust departure as well. I'm going to make this a little bit easier to see by bringing up the number three CDU. And we'll look at the thrust limit on this page here. So let me look at perf and take off. Next page. So the first thing is we're going to use the engine to drive the air conditioning system. So we need to account for engine bleed on. That's going to have an impact on our takeoff performance. So it's gone from 1700, it's only a few meters. That's not a problem. I also want to consider doing a flex thrust departure. The runway is long enough, we've got a huge margin here. So on the thrust limit, go on to the next page and change from takeoff to flex, and then put your flex temperature in. Now at sea level, the maximum flex available is 50 degrees. So let's just use that as a starting point. Looking up here, it calculates the field length. That's looking very reasonable. So nothing to worry about there at all. If it was limiting, uh, hang on, it's not done something. Let me select flex, there we go. Make sure you've actually got flex selected, that helps. So now my field length, it's not happy with that, that's a bit more limiting. So 50 doesn't really work. Let's try 45. Yep, 45 works, and let's maybe split the difference, try 48. So I'm really just trying to find the best flex I can get away with on this runway. And it looks like 2400 meters, that's still sufficient. And uh, those speeds are good to me. It's using the engine bleed, as I said. So, send. Excellent. With that, we're all set up for the takeoff. So we are going to ask for the before takeoff checklist. Before takeoff checklist. Passenger signs. Advised on. Anti-collision light. On. Probes. On. Windshield heat. On. Wing and cowl anti-ice. Not needed. Norm on or off. Continuous ignition. On. ATC TCAS, TARA, Supplemental Ground Wing Anti-Ice Panel, checked, CAS, takeoff config OK. OK, let's uh, taxi over to runway. And the next item he's going to do is put the lights on. So let's just get ready for the runway. I'm going to turn my HUD brightness all the way up now. I mentioned in the previous video about your rotation technique. That might be a factor. Let's finish the checklist. Check. Landing pulse recog lights on. Before takeoff checklist complete. After takeoff checklist next. Right, people have asked about the Challenger's HUD and the landing capability because things like the Dash 8 have got improved landing capability with a heads up display. The Challenger isn't affected by the heads up display. It's a pilot convenience. It doesn't improve the operational capability of the jet. When we talked about rotation, I made it quite clear in the previous video that the rotation is a visual maneuver. What we're trying to do is to lift the instrument panel here up to the horizon. We're not going to rotate by looking at the nose vector here, the nose uh, index here, but we're going to lift the aircraft up to the horizon. So I've talked about the HUD, the reason it's limited, uh, one of the reasons it's uh, pilot convenience rather than a, a landing uh, improvement is it's only powered by a single power supply. There's no redundancy, there's no backup on that. So the HUD could fail at any point. That might be a little bit of epic foreshadowing. Right, brakes released, let's go. So ATS, it's flex with N1. You see it's gonna accelerate a lot slower and the speeds will be just that little bit higher. 80 knots. Really slow to accelerate now, but that's what flex thrust does. There's V1, rotate.
positive rate of climb, just holding the nose where it is, gear up. Now, heads up displays back, I'll put the auto thrust back in, I'll go flight level change because it's flex thrust, I want to protect the climb. I'll trim it, I'll put the autopilot in. So flight level change at uh, 165, that's V2 plus 20. It just means on this slow rate of climb, the aircraft is protected for speed if there's a loss of thrust. At 1000 feet, I'm going to increase the speed to 200 knots. It's a safe flight path, I'll cancel the master caution. I see I've got Gen 1 off, that's not consequential at the moment. Air traffic will give us a heading, so going to heading mode, we'll turn left onto 120, just as we did previously. And above VT plus 5, that's 180 knots. Select flaps up. So it's important when you're dealing with abnormals not to get distracted, especially when it's single pilot. Cancel the caution. Make sure it's nothing that demands your immediate attention. And there's very few things in an aircraft like this that need immediate attention and then concentrate on flying the aircraft. We've got a safe flight path from air traffic control on heading 120 degrees. I'm going to choose vertical speed and reduce the vertical speed down to 1500 feet per minute. I've got some hardware, let me do this, but obviously it's the same as making the inputs here. 200 knots is fine. So let's run the checklist. And remember that the first officer is going to treat it like a normal departure. That's okay for me just now because the APU isn't doing anything. With a generator failure, if the APU is running, I might want to run that checklist manually to make sure I don't shut down the APU. Let's just run the checklist as it stands. After takeoff checklist. Landing gear. Up. Flaps. Zero. Thrust reversers. Off. Ignition. Off. Pressurization. Checked. Pax transition. You see it's not actually doing anything, he's just checking. That's a thousand feet to go. Completed. N1. Climb set. APU generator. Off. APU. Shut down. Passenger signs. We'll ignore that just now. On, offer, auto. Cass. Um, it is checked. Clear. After takeoff, checklist complete. Right, there's alt capture. So at 5,000 feet, with no close-in terrain, the flight path vector is clear. We're not going to fly into anything. And I'm at 200 knots in a clean config. The aircraft is in a safe state. If I get an instruction from the air traffic, such as direct to Rabic, Execute. And then we'll go into nav mode. That's still safe. There's LNAV1. So at 5,000 feet, what is the problem that we've had? Well, it looks like we've had a generator failure. It says Gen 1 off. Let's see if we confirm that by bringing up the uh, AC ELEC page here. And true enough, we can see that the system is running on a single generator. APU generator could help out by giving us two sources, but on a single generator, you see it has shed the buses. The utility buses are shed here and uh, up here. Now, bearing in mind, this is a transatlantic flight we're going to do. You have to think about whether or not you would perform a transatlantic flight single engine, uh, single generator. If you lose that other generator, mid-Atlantic, you'll be on the air-driven generator. Is that something you want to happen? Because it's not something that I'd be very keen on accepting. So that gives us a choice. We can either try and reset the generator. We can return to Montreal for our overweight landing. We can fly around in circles, burning the fuel off. Or if there's somewhere more convenient en route that we could be serviced, if there's somewhere uh, towards the destination, we could burn off the fuel flying in that general direction, trying to arrange for engineering support there. Just minimizing our risk. In this case, we're not able to really complete the mission that we're tasked with unless we attempt to get the generator back online. 
because we don't have the option with the APU. So let's bring up the generator page here. Let's just try the reset. So I'm just going to flick generator one from off, uh, from on to off reset, and then back on. And well, I think we got lucky today. We've got both generators up and running, and we're back into normal operation. Cas is clear. Excellent. Aircraft safe. We can accept any changes from air traffic. So let's say that uh, we're going to accelerate 250 knots. And they're going to tell us to climb up to flight level 370. Just flight level change to 50. And flight level 370. We're on our way with all the problems sorted out. So just to recap, we did an engine start using the air start unit. We taxed out single engine. We then did a cross bleed start. We used flex thrust to minimize the wear on the engine. It produced a longer takeoff roll and a more sluggish uh, climb out. At the point of rotation, we had a generator failure and that managed to temporarily disable the heads up display, which emphasizes the need to always rotate visually, even when you're presented with that heads up display assistance. And finally, we recognize the importance in a very basic abnormal condition or non-normal not to rush into things and just sort out the problem as you're presented with it. I hope all that makes sense. If you do have any comments or questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section. I always look forward to reading them, even if it takes me a little bit longer to get back to you. I do hope you're enjoying the Challenger and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thanks very much.